So I'd like to talk to you today about some of my work I've done on the topic of hate. And so maybe just first I should say something. Why study hate at all? And it's actually a topic that's always been of importance, always has been, and I suspect unfortunately also will be, at least in the near future. And what I've actually found is that a lot of conflicts have changed over the past decades in nature. Whereas, you know, in former centuries, often wars were a lot about conflicts over land and things like that. And the conflict or the fighting was kept, you know, limited to soldiers fighting against soldiers, at least to a certain extent. And nowadays what we can actually see in a lot of conflicts is that civilians may actually even be specifically targeted or that members of one group use their own group as human shields. So things have actually changed quite a bit. And with all those conflicts going on, there's a lot of you know, political negotiation and everything going on. But I really do believe that unless the root of those conflicts is eliminated, it's going to be really hard to find lasting peace in all those conflicts and in those affected regions. And hate is a topic on which not that much research has actually been uh, conduct conducted so far. So here's a short outline of what I'm going to talk about today. First, I will introduce you to the duplex theory of hate, which is the theory that my work is based on. I will then shortly with one slide just summarize a preliminary study that I did just so you have some background and then present two studies. One was conducted in the United States and one that was conducted in Germany. I will then afterwards apply the theory to some practical examples and last but not least also apply, um, introduce you to some other research interests that I have. And if you have any questions, if there's anything you don't understand, feel free to interrupt me and ask any questions. So just to begin with, what is my operational definition of hate? It's an intense dislike or an extreme aversion or hostility. And the duplex theory of hate actually consists of two parts. It has a triangular theory about the structure of hate. And then it also has a story-based part about the development of hate. My work that I'm going to be presenting today is based on the triangular theory. So I'm not going to be talking anymore about the story-based theory. But if you have any questions, feel free to ask. And the triangular theory of hate says that there's actually not just one overarching kind of hate, but that there are actually seven different kinds of hate. And those are made up of three different components, negation of intimacy, passion, and commitment. And the target of hate can be a group or a person. So this would be the structure of hate, like in, a, uh, like in a graphic. And the structure can change depending on how much of each component is present. So the first component is negation of intimacy. And that involves seeking psychological or often also physical distance from the target of hate. So the target does something that evokes disgust or revulsion in people. And then they start actually feeling emotional distress. And of course, when something disgusts you, you try to back off and get away from it. And negation of intimacy is something that develops slowly and also fades slowly and occurs especially when purity and sanctity are violated. For example, if you know, your group has a holy book 
or a holy place, and something is done to that. And as an example, you can take Nazi Germany, where disgust was created in a lot of publications through verbal and pictorial propaganda, and the Jewish population was actually condensed into one single individual that was just described as being really disgusting and revolting. For example, they were called the Jewish bacillus or the greedy Jew. Then passion consists of feelings of anger and or fear. And those feelings are being evoked uh, in response to a threat. So often you feel anger or fear when your um, autonomy is violated or when your rights are being threatened. And as you probably have experienced yourself, when you felt angry or fearful, these feelings can come quickly, but they can also subside relatively quickly. And as an example, we can take Al-Qaeda, now ISIS, that actually depicts the United States as an imminent threat to Muslims all over the world and to their faith and the people and even to God. And the United States are being portrayed, um, portrayed as a force that's actually threatening all Muslims and that has already killed a lot of Muslims. And there's actually like they're seeking to kill even more Muslims. And thus, it, they believe it's actually the duty of every true Muslim to kill Americans. Not only kill their soldiers, but you know, if they can even kill civilians. And finally, the third um, component is commitment. And here people feel contempt of the target of hate. And the target is seen as subhuman or inhuman. And commitment is something that is learned. So that is something that, you know, people can be taught in talks or through flyers, that kids can be taught in classrooms. And it is mainly cognitive in nature. So an example for commitment would be the Middle East, where often radio stations, newspapers, and posters, you can see how they disseminate anti-enemy sentiments. And there may even be certain classes at some schools that teach students to hate the enemy. And what you can also see is that propaganda value of heinous acts is viewed as more important as actually human life. For example, we've probably all seen those videos where people are beheaded, journalists or whatever, that are then used as propaganda. And so when you take these three components and combine them, that is how we get to the seven different kinds of hate. Can you see? So I'm just going to give one example in more detail, and I'm going to go over quickly um, the other kinds of hate. So one example would be boiling hate, which is a combination of negation of intimacy and passion, meaning you've got those re uh, feelings of revulsion and disgust towards the target, and the target is seen as inhuman and needing to be eliminated, but you don't have any permanent commitment to a particular target group. You don't need to read this, but this is just, I was gonna go over it real quickly to show you the other different kinds of hate. So we have cool hate, which would just be negation of intimacy. Cool, because there's no real affect present. Then you have hot hate, which is anger and fear because it consists of the passion component. And there's cold hate, which is just when the commitment component is present. We have boiling hate, which would be the negation of intimacy and passion. Simmering hate or loathing would be the combination of negation of intimacy and commitment. Then seething hate or revilement 
consists of the passion and the commitment component. And then there's burning, hate, or the need for annihilation, which has all three components. It has negation of intimacy, passion, and commitment. And so as I, there is very little empirical research specifically on hate. So when I started wanting to do research on hate, the first thing that was actually missing was an assessment instrument. So a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about today is also the creation of an instrument that can be used in empirical research to assess hate. And before I did my main studies, I did one preliminary study just to look at the scale that I had created. Does it work at all? And I'm just I'm going to go into more detail on the hate scale and everything um, in the next slide. So I just wanted to go over this real quickly and um, say that I had 100 participants and in a study at Yale University. And I gave them the hate scale that I had developed in combination with some scenarios that they read. Those scenarios were to evoke some hate. And I also administered some other scales, um, for example, anger and hostility, emotional intelligence, and social desirability. And I actually found good construct validity in the first study. And the empirical rotated factor structure was as expected. I only did an orthogonal factor analysis. And I found all three components with negation of intimacy having three subcomponents. And I then made some changes to the hate scale based on this preliminary study, because some items didn't work so well. So I exchanged these. And the result was a hate scale that had 36 items, 12 items for each of the three subcomponents. So 12 items to assess negation of intimacy, 12 to assess passion, and 12 to assess commitment. And the goals of the studies that I'm going to present now were twofold. First of all, I wanted to empirically evaluate the theory. And I did this through confirmatory fact analysis. And then second, I also wanted to further validate the hate scale that I had created. And as I had said before, I conducted two studies, one in the United States and one in Germany. And in addition, what I also did, so I, in these studies, I did not only have my participants that filled out those questionnaires. I also had each participant present three evaluators. So everybody who came into the lab was asked to um, actually come up with three persons who they thought knew him or her very well. And those evaluators also completed a subset of those questionnaires. So they were supposed to put themselves into the position of the participant and then complete the hate scenarios. How much hate would the participant feel, but also how how much, how angry are they generally, or the hostility subscale. So I had them fill out quite a few more subscales. That was also because I'm going to show you later on a multi-trait, multi-method matrix. So I could actually construct this. And so how does the hate scale look at all? So with the hate scale, you can potentially measure feelings of hate towards groups or individuals. And of course, it consisted of three subscales like the three components of hate. And it does not necessarily need to be used in combination with scenarios, but I decided to do that so that I had some kind of a comparable basis what people were referring to. An example of an item for negation of intimacy would be, I believe that in some sense, the target group or the target person can be thought of as less than human. An example for a passion item would be, I personally feel threatened by the target group or person. And an example for a commitment item would be, we need to teach our children about the danger of people like, and then again, and so the target group or the target person. And I presented people with four scenarios. 
plus an additional one where I just ask them to think about the person they like least in the world and then fill the hate scale out thinking about that person. And here I'm just going to read two scenarios to you so you get a better idea of what I present at people with. So here's one. Anthony belongs to an ethnic minority group in a starkly segregated country run by the ethnic majority. His family has very few financial resources and no autonomy to assert its rights. Anthony recently became very ill with pneumonia. All efforts within a small community were made to restore his health, but to no avail. His family, as well as a number of friends, pooled money to hire transport for him to the nearest city where the government runs a highly regarded hospital. Upon arrival, he was refused access even to basic medical care by Dr. Smith simply because Anthony lacked any sort of health insurance, which is commonly and arbitrarily denied to his ethnic group. It is now uncertain whether he will survive or, if he does survive, whether or not he will be permanently disabled. And another example would be, Stephen plays college football in a small town where the state university is his team's biggest rival. Both teams were doing well, and late in the season, they were scheduled to face each other in what had become a huge game. In the end, Stephen's team lost by only three points, and they were devastated. The fans on both sides went crazy, and police arrested some kids who started to get violent. In an attempt to cool the air, one of Stephen's teammates suggested that they all go out to a dance club to relax and take their mind off the game. Most of them went and began to enjoy themselves. Later in the evening, the opposing football team member showed up at the same club, most of them intoxicated. An argument broke out, and a member of the other team, Michael, threw a bottle in the direction of Steven's team. A huge fight began, and before security could break it up, Michael stabbed Steven horribly with a broken bottle. After receiving medical treatment, Stephen learned that he would likely never walk again. Charges are currently being brought against members of both teams. So this is the kind of scenario that people were presented with. I did change the scenarios a little bit depending on the culture. So it would actually happen because a football scenario wouldn't work in Germany. So in the studies that I conducted, you cannot directly compare the two cultures, the two countries, because scenarios were slightly different. I then used also a number of other materials. For example, the anger and hostility subscales of the aggression questionnaire from BUS. And an example for the uh, anger scale would be, sometimes I fly off the handle for no good reason or for hostility. I'm suspicious of overly, uh, overly friendly strangers. Then I had some measures of discriminant validity. I had some tests to measure fluid and crystallized intelligence. For example, the letters, actually all of the subtests that I used were from the kit of factor reference cognitive tests. And so I had the letter set uh, tests, for example, where people were presented with different sets of letters and had to pick the one that wouldn't fit. I then had the test figure classification, where people were presented with, say, four or five different figures that belong to group one. And then they saw another set of figures that belong to group two. And then their task was to look at 10 more individual figures and decide, do each of those figures, do they belong to group one or group two? And then there was also a voc vocabulary scale in the American study where you had to do something like choose a word that means the same as the given word. For example, jovial doesn't mean refreshing, scare, thick set, wise, or jolly. I then used the 33 item measure of emotional intelligence. And an item example would be I know when to speak about my personal problems to others. 
And then I also use the extraversion and neuroticism scale from the NeoFFI, as well as the demographic questionnaire. I also had a scale of social desirability just to see if people, if there was a, like a correlation between how people you know, scored in social desirability and what answers they gave on the hate scale. And an example here would be, it is sometimes hard for me to go on with my work if I am not encouraged. So I'm mostly going to talk about the results about two, both of the studies together because the results were very similar. Sometimes I'm going to pick out one study to just give an example of the results. But overall, results were pretty similar. So study one was conducted with students of several universities in Connecticut. I had overall 196 students in the American study, and they provided me with 358 evaluators. And study two had 115 participants. That provided 282 evaluators. On average, they were 22 years of age in the American study and 23 years of age in the German study. And their evaluators in both countries had known them for an average of 12 years, with a standard deviation of about nine years. The means, you don't have to read this, but I, what I just wanted to point out, so the hate scale was scored on a scale from one to seven, with one being, you know, no hate present, and the means of the hate subscales were actually significantly higher than the minimum total that you would get of 12. So for example, we had like in the different scenarios, we had like totals of, you know, 61, 57, 63, something like that. So we could assume that actually, yes, the scenarios worked in evoking some kind of hate in the participants. What I then first did is I did an internal consistency anal in analysis and I checked Cronbach's alpha to look at the items and Cronbach's alpha was actually very high. It was greater than 0.90 in the American study and it was greater than 0.76 in the German study. Also, I have to say that for the German study, I translated the scale so it was the first time that it was used in a study, whereas the American scale I had already evaluated in the preliminary study. I also computed item total correlations. That means I looked for the negation of intimacy subscale. How does each and every item correlate with its own subscale? The same for the passion items and the commitment items. Just because it was a new scale, I wanted to see if a passion item doesn't correlate with the passion subscale, but more with the commitment subscale, something doesn't work. So I actually used the item total correlations to sort out some more items. And overall, they worked pretty well. I found that two negation of intimacy items and two commitment items correlated more often with other subscales, so I did not use those items in the further, in the other computations, in the other analyses, and three passion items. And I then looked at the correlations of the subscales within each scenario. So when I look at one scenario, like the one with the football, um, how do the negation of intimacy, passion, and commitment factors, how do they correlate with each other? And I also looked how do the subscales correlate with each other across scenarios. So I was also interested, like, how does passion, you know, relate, the different passion subscales relate to each other across the scenarios. And it's interesting, what I found was actually that the three different subscales correlated a bit higher with each other within one scenario, and they did with each other across the scenarios. So, for example, negation of intimacy, passion, and commitment within one scenario correlated around 0.66 with each other. And when I then looked at negation of intimacy and how it correlates with the different subscripts across the different scenarios, then I had like a median correlation of 0.41.
But that actually makes sense because the scenarios, first of all, the hate components are somewhat related to each other. So we didn't expect them to be independent of each other. And also, all three subscales, negation of intimacy, commitment, and passion, they refer within a scenario, obviously, to the same example. So we expected them to be correlated. I thought it was just interesting to see that pattern. And next, I conducted an exploratory factor analysis and also did an oblique rotation just because I expected the, the components actually to be related with, uh, with each other. And what I found was actually that the factor structure corresponded well with the three hate components. And in this time, actually, in both studies, I didn't find any subfactors, but rather, and again, you don't have to read any numbers here, but they loaded clearly on three factors. So what I did here is, first of all, as I said before, I deleted some items per scale, and I also did not display any pattern coefficients of less than 0.3. If you look at negation of intimacy, you see how it clearly loads on one factor. And then the same for passion. We have some loadings and other factors, but generally you have a clear pattern and for commitment as well. And then I also looked at the correlations with other subscales and found that we had low but significant correlations of the hate subscales with anger. That, of course, was expected. We expected for hate to be correlated with anger and with hostility. We found trivial correlations with academic intelligence. And then some low and some trivial uh, correlations with neuroticism and, and hate in study too. Also, we found low correlations with emotional intelligence. And those were actually positive, which was a bit of a surprise because I expected for emotional intelligence to correlate negatively with hate because I thought, well, the more people are emotionally intelligent, the less they're actually going to really feel the need to hate other groups. One possible explanation for those positive correlations could also just be that people who score higher on emotional intelligence are more aware of their feelings. And if they then find that actually their feelings are justified, then you know, they might also more readily actually admit to feelings of hate. And for extroversion, we found some low correlations between like around 0.15 with hate in study one, and there were no correlations in the German study. What I then did is, since we had all the data of the evaluators, I looked, well, how much do the evaluators actually agree with each other? And yes, they did agree with each other. In study one, it was between 0.31 and 0.52. And in study two, it was between 0.43 and 0.51. For external scales that I also used, anger and hostility, they agreed a little bit more, which in a way also makes sense when you think about it. When you know someone, you kind of know how easily they get angry or how hostile they are towards other people. But with feelings of hate, that's nothing that you really talk so much about other people. Or even when someone feels it, they may not readily talk about it and share those feelings with others. And that was also actually the same that I found when I like correlated the assessments of the evaluators with the participants themselves. So I also found that actually there were um, that there were correlations present, but again, for anger and hostility and extroversion, and in the case of the German study, also neuroticism, you could see that there was just more agreement between the participant scores and the evaluators putting themselves into the pos uh, position of the participant than for the hate scores. So hate seems just to be something that's just really hard to predict. And 
then the data of the evaluators essentially showed the same thing again, that we had correlations of around 0.20 of the subscale, the hate scale with anger and hostility, and trivial correlations for hate with extroversion. They were like negative in the German study with a mean of like minus 0.13. And what I then did to have a look at the contract validity was I created a multi-trait, multi-method matrix. Again, you don't have to read the numbers in detail. I'm just going to point out some things to you. So what we actually have here is we have the correlations of the data of the participants and then also the evaluators. So we're correlating different traits with each other that also have been assessed with different methods. And what we have here is the reliabilities. That should be consistently the highest values in the ma matrix. And yes, they turned out to be the highest values. Another thing that you can look at is the validity diagonal here. What this actually shows is you look at correlations of the same trait that's measured by different methods. So you want those numbers to be significantly different from zero, and you want them to be as high as possible, and especially higher than the values in their rows or in their columns, where we look at traits, like different traits, that have been measured by different methods. And then the blue block here is a hetero method block. And that actually shows you the correlations between different traits as measured by different methods. And what you can see here is that obviously for the hate scenarios, we had relatively high correlations. And then, and I also have to point out one thing. So the data that went in here weren't quite the same data for the correlations and the factor analysis I presented to you before because it was actually just, um, it was a significantly lower number of participants because I only used the data of the participants here that also provided three evaluators because obviously some people only sent in, you know, sent back two evaluators. and. So the correlations look a little bit different here. For example, the correlations, the correlations between anger and hostility, uh, of anger and hostility with hate are somewhat lower here than they are when I use the data of all the participants. What I also have here in yellow is the monomethod block. That means you look at the correlations of different traits as measured by the same method. And again, you can see that the hate scenarios correlate significantly with each other. And there are some correlations between anger and hostility and hate, and lower correlations between other measures like extroversion and neuroticism with hate. In the picture here actually was even clearer for the participants, meaning we had higher correlations between anger, hostility, and hate in this matrix for the evaluator's data than for the participant's data. This is just shortly here. You can see again the correlations of the hate scenarios with each other and then anger and hostility for the participants and for the evaluators. And so not only wanted, did I want to come up with a measurement instrument that works and that can be used in future research, but I also wanted to have a look at the theory itself. Well, do the data actually represent the model? And what I did is I conducted confirmatory factor analyses. And here, all I want to show you is the model that I used, because I used two slightly different models. Here you can see I fed all the different items of the hate subscales into the model. 
the negation of intimacy items, the passion items, and the commitment items. And then what I actually did was I parceled the items into two item parcels, meaning that two items, like the items within one subscale were randomly assigned to each other and then averaged so that I could reduce the number of items that went into the confirmatory factor analysis. So I did this so I had fewer items because that would reduce the error variance and then also it would lessen the ratio of the number of variables to sample size because for a confirmatory fact analysis you need really big sample sizes. And so essentially here you see the new model. It's essentially the same but we have fewer items actually going into the different components. And you can read this, but I'm not going to give you a statistics lesson on the different things. I just wanted to point out I used some absolute fit indices like chi-square divided by um, degrees of freedom. So essentially these items, they compare the model with the sample data and look at the fit. And then I had the goodness of fit index. <coughs> I also looked at incremental fit indices like the comparative fit index and um, the root mean square error of approximation. And the results were moderate when I used all the individual items. And when I parceled them and had fewer items, then we actually had very good results um, that actually showed that there was a good model fit and that the data represented um, the model pretty well. So just as a summary, I found that the hate scale has good internal consistency reliability, that the factor structure, component, uh, factor structure com corresponded well to the hate components, and we also had good construct validity. And yes, also, the data fit the model of hate, the theoretical models. And especially with the parceling, we found that there was a very good fit. So it was nice to see that actually the components seem to be very close to psychological reality because people differed on the dimensions of negation of intimacy, passion, and commitment. So it wasn't like everybody showed the same pattern. There was a difference, and people also seem to be able to think in terms of these three components, and were able to assess them reliably because we found, you know, satisfactory um, concordance between the evaluators and also between the data of the evaluators and the participants. And so you can use that theory to describe and explain at some level the development of hate with the three different com components because some of the component, components like passion actually rise and fade quicker than others. You can, ex uh, you can empirically assess the relation between different hate types and behavior. And potentially also one can identify factors and conditions under which different kinds of hate are, are elicited. And also it would be interesting to actually look into the possibilities of regulation of the different hate types. So meaning if you have a certain type of hate in a certain situation, maybe it needs different interventions than in another situation where people feelings just differ in structure. And so I just wanted to give you some examples of how the theory may apply. When we look, for example, of child soldiers and child terrorists, for example, the negation of intimacy component is present because those children are being actually taught to loathe those other people that belong to their enemy group. And in some cases, it's not even clear exactly who the enemy is, but they're just being really taught to be disgusted of that other group. And when then people or the kids in that example see their comrades being killed in combat, 
that certainly arouses anger and fear. So there's a passion component present. Or in the case of child terrorists, of course, when they see how their friends are being glorified for having killed themselves, that also elicits some passionate feelings. And then the commitment component would be present through training programs in which children participate and where they're being indoctrinated and turned into fighting machines. Another application would be victims of war. For example, when children experience the enemy just as, as killers who kill their friends, members of their family, and so on. And so that just leads them to kind of like feel disgusted of and revolted of those other people. And of course, the passion component would be present when they see members of their families killed. And again, the commitment component would be present when children are taught in classes at school that the enemy is no good. They should hate the enemy and you know, they should fight the enemy whenever possible. And a third application is anti-Semitism, or you can just do, you know, fill it in for any other anti-religion. So for example, the negation of intimacy component would be evoked when children hear that Jews are just somehow different from the rest of us, from the rest of the population. The passion component would be invoked when, when the children learn that it was Jews that killed Jesus. And the commitment component would be invoked when the children are taught that Jews throughout history have been, you know, unfair money lenders, conspirators, enemies of God, and so on. So you can ap actually apply those components to quite a few different situations. And so there's a lot of different things since there hasn't been many studies with respect to hate. There's a lot that still can be done. And for example, you could see if the hate scale can really assess individual differences. I'd also be very interested in looking more into cultural differences in the feelings of hate. It would also be very interesting to see if the structure of hate differs depending on the target. So when a religious group is being hated, do the feelings of hate differ from, you know, when it's like you're having some hostile feelings towards a neighbor or towards another country? And it would be very interesting also to do validations in countries where extreme hate is a part of daily life. Because obviously in the United States and in Germany where I conducted the studies, extreme hate isn't something that most people would experience on a daily basis. And you could also conduct the qualitative studies of the properties of hate in those countries. And I'm also interested in the relation, for example, between hate and prejudice. And what I think is also needed here, because we, also, we only have like a questionnaire measure to assess hate, it would also be very interesting and important actually to combine that with behavioral measures. 